All right, guys, welcome back. Unit two now. So I'm right now. I'm again praying that you have done all the necessary memorization and other preparatory things that I instructed you guys to do in unit one. So let's get on with unit two. First topic, arguably one of the most important topics, is our discussion of bonds. Okay. Well, we're going to be discussing the two that many of you are probably familiar with. Ionic and covalent bonds. Okay, so for those of you who are new to chemistry, we're gonna go in depth, don't worry. If you look at your periodic table right now, you'll see on the left side, uh, the first two columns would be your alkali and alkaline metals. Uh, the columns to the right of that, you know, three, four, five, ba da 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 da, the columns that make up that valley in the center of your periodic table, those are called the transition metals. And then on the far right side of your uh, periodic table, you have what's called the noble gases, is the rightmost column, the halogens, uh, just to the left of that, and this small region between the valley and the halogens, which represent the Nonmetals. The halogens are included in the group of nonmetals. Alkali and alkaline uh, species are considered metals. Okay? So, an ionic bond, granted what I just told you about the classifications of the different elements on the periodic table, an ionic bond occurs between a metal and a nonmetal. Okay, more commonly between a metal and a halogen. So let's get into precisely what an ionic bond is. If you look at your reference table, uh, the one of the most common ionic bonds is table salt. Okay, NaCl, sodium chloride. Okay, Cl, chlorine, if you look on your periodic table, is in the halogen column. And sodium, as you can look on, is in the first column, the alkali column. So sodium is an alkali metal, and Cl is, well, it's a non-metal, but more specifically, it's a halogen, okay? Again, the halogens are included as a subgroup of the non-metals. And the metal, since it's since in this case it's in the first column, again, this applies to the second column as well. In the first column, sodium, let's draw its Bohr model, has its first energy level, second energy level, yada, 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 and it has one valence electron, okay? If you haven't figured out until now, First column has one valence electron, second column has two valence electrons, sixth column has six valence electrons, eighth column has eight valence electrons, just a heads up in case you haven't taken notice of that. So since sodium is in our first column, it has one valence electron. Chlorine, since it's in uh, the halogen column, since it's in the seventh column, has seven valence electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay? And we talked about this thing in the previous unit called electron affinity. All the halogens, since they have seven valence electrons, have a very high electron affinity. Okay? All of the atoms want to have a completed valence shell. All of the atoms want to have a completed octet, a complete eight electrons in their valence shell. So this guy, he has seven. He's very close, okay? And he has such a high electron affinity that he has enough energy to take sodium's electron and steal it for himself, okay? So in the ionic bond of sodium chloride, chlorine, this atom right here, I should label these, chlorine, sodium. Chlorine steals an electron from sodium and completes its valence shell to get eight electrons. And now sodium, since it's lost 
the electron, the single electron it had in its valence shell. Now it just has the energy levels beneath. And if we remember from the Aufbau principle, all of the previous energy levels fill up before we put that electron there. Therefore, removing that electron exposes the complete octet underneath. So now sodium has a complete octet. Another example would be magnesium chloride, MgCl2. Magnesium is in the second column. So, now that since we know it's in the second column, we know it has two valence electrons, okay? And we already know what chlorine looks like. Chlorine's right up here. Chlorine has seven valence electrons, okay? So in order for chlorine to complete its octet, it's going to steal an electron. It has a very powerful electron affinity, so it can do that. But magnesium still has another electron. So we need another chlorine atom with seven valence electrons to come over and steal the other one. Okay? So that's why magnesium forms two ionic bonds to two chlorine atoms, or it could form an ionic bond to a chlorine atom and a fluorine atom, MgClF. Both Cl and fluorine are halogens, both accept one electron, so both you need two halogens to satisfy the ionic bonding potential of magnesium, all right? And the reason we call these ionic bonds is because in water, in solution, every time you hear the words in solution, that just means in water, in water, they dissociate, okay? So if we took this and we threw it into a bunch of H2O, then it would dissociate into Mg2+, plus, plus a Cl-, minus, plus an F-, minus, okay? In, like I explained very in detail in the previous video, fluorine has a minus charge because it has an extra electron. Chlorine has a minus charge because it has an extra electron. Magnesium has a 2 plus charge because it lost two electrons. It lost two negatively charged particles, so it has a 2 plus charge. Okay? Uh, basically, what uh, in solution, the bonds, the ionic bonds break, and the individual atoms, or and now they're called ions because they have charges, and the ions separate from one another. And I'm going to come back to this idea of ions and solution uh, later in the video when we cover uh, things like dipoles. This is going to come up very important in that topic. But anyway, we covered ionic bonds. Now let's go to covalent. Okay, a covalent bond happens between two nonmetals. Nonmetal bonded to nonmetal. Okay, let's take CO2 for example. All right, CO2 is a carbon atom bonded to two oxygen atoms, it's two double bonds. We'll, we'll cover the structures again later in the video. Okay, so carbon, if you look on your periodic table, has four valence electrons. Four valence electrons. One, two, three, four. Okay? Oxygen has six valence electrons. Three, four, five, six. Okay? So carbon needs four electrons to complete its octet, and oxygen needs two electrons to complete its octet. So, in a covalent bond, electrons are not stolen, like an ionic bond. In a covalent bond, electrons are shared, okay? Think of this as capitalism, think of this as communism. <laughs> They're shared such that now these two electrons right here can 
enter into sort of uh, orbital overlap, okay? And what that means is carbon and oxygen come close together until their orbitals overlap, so that the orbitals in oxygen's or uh, the electrons in oxygen's orbitals now enter carbon's orbitals, and the electrons in carbon's orbitals now enter oxygen's orbitals. So it's sharing. It's a nice, happy community, okay? So carbon orbital here, oxygen orbital here, electron, electron. Now you see two electrons are, sure, are shared between both orbitals, okay? Now I can draw another set of orbitals, slightly bigger, around each atom. And I, another electron in this orbital, another electron in this orbital. So you can see there are two orbitals overlapping, there are two bonds, okay? And in each covalent bond, there are two electrons present. One electron originated from one species, the other electron originated from the other species, okay? So, this is a double bond between carbon and oxygen, because carbon is sharing two electrons with oxygen, and oxygen is sharing two electrons with carbon, okay? So, in this double bond, oxygen has gained access to an additional two electrons, and now it's completed in its octet. That's why you see a double bond here. But carbon has also only gained two electrons, but it needs four to complete its octet. So it forms a double bond with another oxygen atom, okay? Because the electrons are not stolen, because the electrons are still within the orbitals of their original partner atom, there is no dissociation of covalent bonds within water. Okay, CO2 does not dissociate in water. So, uh, let's say I gave you, uh, what's, what's a good covalent bond to practice with? Uh, okay, H2O. H2O. Oxygen has six valence electrons. Hydrogen has one valence electron. Why don't you go and figure out how the covalent bond forms in H2O? All right. So um, I assume you've co you're coming back from that. We have got an oxygen atom. It's got six valence electrons. We've got a hydrogen atom. Hydrogen atom, each have one. Okay. Now keep in mind... Hydrogen atoms uh, have their outermost orbital as the 1s orbital. And we know from the previous video that the 1s orbital only needs two electrons to be filled, right? I should call it the first energy level. The first energy level only needs two electrons to be filled. The second energy level needs eight electrons to be filled. Okay. So... Hydrogen has one electron. It's going to take that one electron and it's going to enter it into the bond. Oxygen has six electrons. It's going to take one of those electrons and enter it into the bond. So now there are two electrons in the bond and both atoms have access to those electrons. So now hydrogen has two electrons total, and oxygen has seven electrons total from this bond, okay? We have a second hydrogen here. The hydrogen takes its one, uh, one electron and enters it into the bond. Oxygen takes one of its electrons, enters it into the bond, and now you've got two electrons here that can be shared by both atoms, okay? Oxygen had seven, now it's got eight. Hydrogen had one, now it's got two, okay? In general, with covalent bonds, well, with every covalent bond, both atoms in the bond gain one electron per bond, okay? So in a double bond, both atoms would gain two electrons, like you saw with CO2. In a double bond, oxygen would gain two electrons. Now it has eight. 
carbon, since it's engaging with four bonds here, would gain four electrons. Now it went from four to eight. Heavily tied in with the uh, idea of covalent bonding is the idea of electronegativity. So I briefly hinted electronegativity in the previous video, and now we're going to cover it much more in depth. So I use the example of carbon and fluorine, okay? So to re-examine that, I'm just going to remind you of the periodic trend for electronegativity. If I draw my periodic table, electronegativity increases as you go down a row. So for, uh, in the same row, the atoms further to the right will be more electronegative. And in the same column, electronegativity increases as you go up. So fluorine is more electronegative than chlorine. Okay, and if you combine those two arrows, you get a general upward trend like that, where in the bottom left-hand corner, you have the least electronegative, and in the top right, you have the most electronegative. How about we take the example of the this, the CO2 bond, the carbon-oxygen bond. Let's just take a look at half of the atom, just for the sake of explaining electronegativity. Okay? If you look at your periodic table, oxygen is further to the right than carbon, and they're in the same row. Therefore, oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. Alright? If you remember from my explanation, being more electronegative means that, okay, this is a double bond, we've got four electrons present in this bond. And because oxygen's more electronegative, oxygen will be holding these electrons much closer to it in the bond, okay? It's, being, it's like being a stronger magnet. Even though both species in the bond are participating in the shared electrons, they're both sharing their electrons and gaining electrons, the actual position of the electrons is much closer to the oxygen than the carbon, because oxygen is more electronegative. Okay, and since the uh, negative charge is held much closer to the oxygen, the oxygen itself can be seen as having a partial negative charge. This symbol denotes uh, partial negative charge. The symbol is usually uh, used with uh, drawing electronegativity diagrams. And since each system needs to have a sum of zero charge, okay, the carbon then develops a positive charge because the negative charge is held further from the carbon. You gotta remember that for all of uh, chemistry. Every system, every diagram, every reaction needs to net zero total charge. So if one species has a partial negative, another species needs to have a partial positive. Okay? If there is one ion in solution with a 2 plus charge, there needs to be another ion in solution with a 2 minus charge, or two ions each with a 1 minus charge. Okay? So, because this has a partial positive charge and this has a partial negative charge, we can say that there exists a dipole, a gradient of charge between these two atoms, okay? So, and this brings us to the discussion of polarity. A bond is a polar bond if it develops a dipole. Again, a dipole is one atom as incurs a partial negative and the other atom incurs a partial positive. If that happens, you have a polar bond, you know, like the two poles of a magnet. That's exactly what this is like. It's like the two poles of a magnet. And as you might predict, the partial negative on this oxygen will want to associate with another positive charge, because opposites attract. It's just like magnets. Okay? So this would be considered a polar bond. A nonpolar bond would be a bond in which 
the atoms both have the same or similar electronegativity, okay? For the vast majority of cases, the only time you will see a bond that is nonpolar is if it's carbon bonded to carbon, or oxygen bonded to oxygen, or chlorine bonded to chlorine, or two of the same species bonded to each other. That is not a polar bond. Why? Because same species, same electronegativity, right? Same electronegativity, the uh, electrons are held in the exact center, and neither atom gains any partial charge. Okay, the only other situation in which you have a nonpolar bond is the CH bond, for reasons I have discussed in the previous video. Moving on. How do bonds form? That brings us to uh, what is very commonly seen on the AP Chemistry exam, something called a potential energy diagram. And it's very useful in understanding what exactly a bond is. Potential energy diagram looks like this, okay? It's on uh, a y-axis with an x-axis in the middle, okay? So on the y-axis you have plotted your potential energy. Um, this is usually in joules or kilojoules. So in a bond obviously there's two atoms present, so there's two nuclei present. So we need to introduce a topic, uh, excuse me, a how to call this, a characteristic of atoms and bonds. If you happen to have taken AP Biology before this class, uh, how to put this, you have been brainwashed into believing falsities that we must work to correct right now. Okay? Let me say this very clearly so there's no misinterpretation. It takes energy to break bonds. It releases energy to form bonds. The act of forming bonds releases energy, okay? So if I have a free carbon atom, not bonded to anything, floating in space, and I have a free oxygen atom, not bonded to anything, floating in space, when those two come together and they form the CO bond, that releases a lot of energy, okay? Like I said before, it's like magnets. Think of carbon as a magnet floating around in space, doing nothing. Oxygen as a magnet floating around in space, doing nothing. When they want to come together, okay, they release energy. There's a loud clack when you hear magnets coming together and colliding, right? And you need to input energy. You need to work with your, I'm assuming, strong arms and input energy to separate those magnets, okay? You need to put in energy to break bonds, and it releases energy to form bonds. So if I have two magnets separated from one another, they have a very high potential energy, okay? Because I can release that potential energy by bringing them close to each other, okay? When they're close to each other, they have very low potential energy because they've released it all. Okay? So, when they're bonded to each other, we're in a low potential energy state. And when we're separated from each other, we're in a high potential energy state. In order to take something from a low potential energy state to a high potential energy state, I need to input my own energy with my two hands to separate the magnets. Okay? The energy that I put in raises the energy, the potential energy of the system. The potential energy diagram generally looks a little something like this, okay? Where here is some like really far distance between the atoms, like one inch, and here is some infinitely close distance between the atoms, like 1 times 10 to the negative 20 uh, inches, okay? Like some molecularly small distance, you know, because we're dealing with atoms. So potential energy, you're gonna, let's call this a zero. We're in a high state of potential energy right here. Here, 
at the trough of the graph is what we call the location of the bond, okay? The bond forms at this trough of the graph, okay? Since this is, the x-axis is distance between the nuclei, right here they're pretty separated in space, and as we bring them closer together, their potential energy drops until their potential energy reaches a minimum, okay? If they're, once their potential energy reaches a minimum, then they're in a bond, all right? If I want to separate them, I need to input my own energy to separate them. All right, now on this side of the graph, this is better explained with Coulomb's law, which we learned in the last video. Coulomb's law states that two positively charged particles will repel each other. Two positively charged nuclei will repel each other. Okay, so if you bring the nuclei close enough such that the attractive force between the electrons of one atom and the nucleus of the other atom is now too weak to combat the repulsive force between two nuclei, because again, the nuclei are much more concentrated at the center, the charge is much more concentrated at the center of the atom. If the internuclear distance becomes close enough, like if you Think of the nucleus as a positively charged particle or a north pole. If you bring the two north poles close enough, they're going to repel, okay? And if you've ever tried to pull, push two north poles end to end really close to each other, you're inputting a lot of energy into the system. You yourself are, with your hands, inputting energy into the system. So that's where this spike in potential energy comes from. This comes from you trying to force two nuclei together or two north poles together. Okay, so the general way in which this appears on the AP exam is they give you um, this graph for, let's say, uh, C, what is it? C, S bond, okay? Carbon sulfur. All right, and they ask you what would the graph look like for CO relative to this, okay? So the way you would go about uh, looking at that is you would see, okay, O is just above sulfur. Therefore, since it is above sulfur, O is smaller than sulfur. O has one less energy level, okay? And since O is smaller, CO can come a lot closer together in their bond, all right? So their bond forms a lot closer to the y-axis, and it forms further down. O has fewer protons, so O's nucleus is less positively charged, and it's a less powerful north pole. So this upward curve is mitigated by that, okay? the bond potential energy is able to go a lot lower because the repulsive forces are not as strong, okay? So if it asks you to draw the curve for CO, they're grading you on two things. They're going to grade you on two things. They're not going to grade you on how straight your line is. They're going to grade you on, is your line below that of CS? And is it further to the left of that of CS? You need to have correct placement in the up-down dimension and the left-right dimension, okay? And the general rule is, if you go down, you go left. If you go up, you go right, all right? It's really only two options. Just remember that. If you go down, you also go left. If you go left, you also go down. They're mutually exclusive for the most part. Okay, next, we're going to delve into ionic solids, okay? So, what's an ionic solid? Salt, NaCl, is an ionic bond, and I think we all know salt is a solid. So, we're, just for the sake of the course, we're just looking at the structure, the molecular structure of how it works, okay? The NaCl bond exists a bunch, a lot, among a bunch of other Cl, NaCl bonds, okay? And they would be arranged like this.
alternating back and forth. Because remember, in our situation up here, and A takes on a positive charge because it loses an electron, and Cl takes on a negative charge because it gains an electron, okay? So just like magnets, the negative charge wants to be surrounded by all the positive charges, and the positive charge wants to be surrounded by all the negative charges, okay? So, even though it's a bond between only two atoms, the atoms are arranged such that they all form one big block, so to speak. Okay? The, the, the network repeats such that it, it forms the entire solid as such. Now, uh, when this comes up and they ask you questions about this, this generally... It's, you, it's all, all, almost always exclusively multiple choice problem where they would give you the bond of NaCl, and they would ask you which structure best represents the structure of NaCl, okay? And they would give you something that looked like this. They would give you something where the Na's are next to each other and the Cl's are next to each other, which is obviously wrong for reasons I just told you. And the second variation they would give you is they would draw Na big and Cl small, or they would draw Cl big and Na small, okay? And they would show the relative sizes of the two particles on the multiple choice problem. So you'd have to go back to ionic radius to figure out which one's the bigger one and which one's the smaller one, okay? So Na and Cl, they're in the same row, they're in the third row from the top, and Cl is all the way on the right, Na is all the way on the left. And if you just memorize the periodic trends that I went through in the previous video, uh, ionic radius is largest in the bottom left and smallest in the top right. Cl is the top right, Na is the top left. Okay? So on the left, you have larger ionic radius. On the right, you have smaller ionic radius. So the one with Cl as the smaller... Uh, species would be the correct answer, of course, arranged in the alternating fashion. Okay, next we need to cover metallic bonds, the structure of metallic solids and alloys, okay? So the metallic bond is often a bond between, let's, let's use copper, for example, Cu. Don't confuse it with Co, Co is cobalt. It's just a bunch of CO, CU, excuse me, CU atoms arranged sort of in a grid-like pattern, like a cube. And in this way, the metallic bond is one that it incorporates a lot of atoms into a single bond. So the CU, 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 this, this is all effectively one bond. What I mean by that is there's no electron interaction between two copper atoms, like we saw in ionic and covalent bond. That's why this is a different type of bond. This is a metallic bond. Sort of, there's one big bond and every atom contributes to it. Like communism. So, uh, in the metallic bond, there is a delocalized sea of electrons. Now, what does that mean? It means that the valence electrons from each copper atom are removed from the copper atom's valence shell and they're free to move about the uh, valence shells of any copper atom they choose. It's delocalized. That's what we mean by saying delocalized. The local electrons that belong to a local copper atom are removed from that copper atom and they're free to move about how they like. So that's delocalized. Okay? So because of that, because the electrons are delocalized and they're free to move how they like, that's why metals are great conductors, because they're, uh, the electrons in metals can flow freely. Wow! It's also why they're extremely strong, because the bond is pretty much a bond between all atoms.
high melting points. You know, they're just very rigid. I, I, th I think you guys know how have handled metals before. You know they're very rigid. Alloys, it's a little interesting, okay? So let's consider each of these having a certain size, certain ionic radius, etc., etc., okay? So alloys are formed, of course, when you mix two metals or a metal and some other compound, okay? One, you can have the substitutional alloy. The substitutional alloy is Okay, instead of all copper, I'm going to take away some copper atoms, and I'm going to replace them with iron. And the key about the substitutional alloy is in replacing copper atoms with iron atoms, they're still the same size. That's the key with the substitution alloy. It doesn't change the shape of the complex because the copper and the iron atoms are still generally similar size. The other type of alloy is called the interstitial alloy. The interstitial alloy is when you've got a bunch of metal atoms in their metallic bond, and in the little areas you see here between all of the atoms, you're able to fit a much smaller atom like a carbon. What else do we have to cover today? Oh, my favorite, Lewis structures. So what is a Lewis structure? A Lewis structure is an attempt to represent or visualize a molecule, okay? So we've got the molecular formula for carbon dioxide, CO2, the Lewis structure for CO2 would be C, double bond O, double bond O, okay? Now, in drawing Lewis structures, we've got the periodic table designation for the element. We've got bonds. One more thing, they also feature this thing called lone pairs, okay? So what is a lone pair? If you know oxygen, has six valence electrons. Since it is participating in two bonds, two of oxygen's valence electrons are participating in that bond, okay? For each bond, each bond takes one valence electron that participates in that bond. If Cl were to participate, chlorine were to participate in a covalent bond, one of the seven valence electrons of Cl would go and participate in the bond. Okay, so since two of oxygen's valence electrons are here participating in the bond, it has four other valence electrons that are over doing nothing. So we represent those in the Lewis structure. One, two, three, four. Four valence electrons over there doing nothing. Okay, and one pair is called a lone pair. So you're going to need to know how to draw the lone pairs on each atom, okay? Oxygen, again, here is participating in one, two bonds. So it has four valence electrons doing nothing. Carbon has four valence electrons and is participating in four bonds. No electrons are left over, no lone pairs. So a favorite on uh, all of the Lewis structure, FRQs, Lewis structure questions, is asking you to draw the Lewis structure for the polyatomic ions that you memorized. You should have memorized in the last video, okay? So let's take an example for one of them. Uh, sulfate, SO4, 2 minus, okay? So let's get into how we draw a Lewis structure for a species that has a 2 minus. Step one, you draw brackets and you draw the two minus on the outside. If you don't do that, the whole thing's wrong. I hate it, it's a terrible rule, but you gotta play by their rules. You draw your brackets, you draw the two minus. You don't need to draw those if it doesn't have a charge, but if it has a charge, do, do that, okay? Now you can draw your Lewis structure. Okay, so we have sulfur as our first 
atom in the formula, so sulfur would be our central atom. It's what everything is going to be bonded to. Okay. And let's count up all of the valence electrons that we have in this system. Okay, so sulfur has six valence electrons. Oxygen has six valence electrons, plus six times four, plus the two minus, plus two electrons. So that's six times five plus is 30, 32. So we have 32 valence electrons in this Lewis structure. And our job is to draw a Lewis structure that incorporates all of those electrons meaningfully, okay? Now, there are multiple ways to draw a Lewis structure. So, I could uh, say uh, we've got SO4. We could do double bond, double bond, double bond, double bond, O, 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 each with two lone pairs. Okay. That would give us one, two, three, four. Oh, we count up each of the bonds first. So each bond takes two electrons. Each bond has two electrons participating in it. So two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16. So we've got 16 electrons in bonds, and we've got two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16. 16 electrons as lone pairs. Okay? So that gives us our total of 32 electrons. So this is a Lewis structure you could write. However, it's not the correct one. And let me get into how to do how to determine the correct one. So we have this thing called formal charge. Formal charge. Formal charge is determined like this. Number of valence electrons minus number of electrons in bond minus number of lone pairs excuse me number of number of non-bonding electrons so number of lone pairs times 2 the number of electrons out here doing nothing number of electrons doing nothing, I'm going to call it, equals formal charge. Okay, so let me give you an example. Oxygen, in this case. Oxygen has six valence electrons. Six. Minus number of electrons in bond. So we oxygen donates one electron to this bond, one electron to that bond. So it's got two electrons in the bond. Number of electrons doing nothing, one, two, three, four, four. Formal charge, zero. Six minus two minus four is zero. Let's take a look at sulfur. Sulfur has, again, six valence electrons. Number of electrons participating in a bond, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight. Number of electrons doing nothing, zero. Formal charge, minus two. Okay. So, that is also needs to be written in our Lewis structure. So, in this Lewis structure, we determined oxygen has a formal charge of zero, so we would write a zero next to the oxygen. We just determined sulfur has a, a formal charge of negative two. So we'd write a negative 2 next to the sulfur, and you'd do that for all of the atoms in the Lewis structure. Okay? So, the rule for Lewis structures is the correct Lewis structure, 1, has um, the most zero formal charges. Okay, so in this case, 
Having a zero on the oxygen is good. We want a zero formal charge. Having a minus two on the sulfur is bad. We don't want a formal charge that is anything apart from zero. But in sometimes it's necessary. Okay? Two. If formal charge is present, if formal charge is present, it must be on the most electronegative atom. Electronegative atom. Okay? So in this case, we have a formal charge of minus 2, okay? But the minus 2 is on the sulfur. Oxygen is more electronegative than sulfur. Therefore, this is wrong. Okay? Uh, another way you could, you could attempt to draw this Lewis structure is sulfur single bonds to four oxygens. Okay, and in that case, each would have three lone pairs. Okay, let's count this up. Two, four, six, eight electrons and bonds. Two, four, six, twelve, twenty-four, plus twenty-four electrons standing around doing nothing. That gives us our total of thirty-two electrons. However, the formal charge on this is minus one, formal charge on this is minus one, formal charge on that's minus one, formal charge on that's minus one, formal charge on the sulfur is plus two. Okay, so that's even more wrong. Okay, this, in this case, we've got zeros on all the oxygens and a minus two just on the sulfur. So, in order to write the correct Lewis structure, the formal charge must always be present on the most electronegative atom. So let's try a third time to write the Lewis structure for SO4 2 minus. We would draw our brackets, we would draw the 2 minus on the outside, we would draw our sulfur in the middle. We want, since sulfur isn't very electronegative, we want it to have either a zero or a positive formal charge. Okay. So, in this case, it does have a positive formal charge, but all, none of the formal charge is being minimized. Okay, in this case, the formal charge is being minimized, but sulfur has a minus two charge. So, let's try and get a sweet spot. Let's try and assign sulfur a formal charge of zero. How would sulfur get a formal charge of zero? Okay, so sulfur has six valence electrons. How about we make it have six bonds? Okay, six bonds means two double bonds, two single bonds. That would give sulfur a formal charge of zero. Okay, so if we double bond it to one of the oxygens, that's two lone pairs here, that would give it a formal charge of zero. So, two formal charges of zero. Now the other oxygen atoms, since they're only participating in one bond, would have three lone pairs and would each have a formal charge of minus one. Has the most zero formal charges. Correct. There's nothing I can do to make uh, the formal charges more zero. Closer to absolute values closer to zero. Two, if the formal charges are present, it must be on the most electronegative atom. Oxygen is the most electronegative atom, therefore this is the best Lewis structure. And on the exam, they will not ask you to draw a Lewis structure, they will ask you to draw the best Lewis structure. There is only one best Lewis structure. However, that brings us to the exception to that rule, something called resonance. Let me erase these to give me more space. Resonance is when there are multiple iterations of a best Lewis structure. And what I mean when I say multiple iterations, I mean the Lewis structure 
and the amount of bonds within it doesn't change, only their orientation changes. So a perfect example of that would be S, single bond, single bond, double bond, du uh, double bond. Oh. Okay. Here, the double bonds are on the top and bottom. Here, on they're on the top and left. And you could also draw another one where on they're on the left and right. And you can draw another one where on they're on the uh, bottom and right. And you can see how the orientation, even though the formal charges on everything never changes, the orientation of uh, the the location, I should say, the location of the atoms never changes. It's only the locations of the bonds that changes. So, if you drew each of the any of these, they would still qualify as the best Lewis structure. Okay? But, since you can draw multiple Lewis structures in which you only change the orientation of the bonds, you can say that SO4 2 minus, or the sulfate ion, has resonance. Okay, and that's designated by the double-headed arrow. Resonance means that it's, it's a phenomenon, so don't expect a concrete explanation as to why it happens. I'm only explaining what it is. Resonance means that if you're able to draw multiple Lewis structures with differing only by the location of the bonds, it means that it's the atom is not, is not this, it's not that, rather it's something in between, okay? So how can it be in between? It means that here we have two double bonds and two single bonds. The actual sulfate ion would therefore have only one type of bond, okay? That one type of bond would not be a single bond or a double bond. It would be a bond that is the average of all the bonds present. So you've got two double bonds and two single bonds. The average of that is a 1.5 bond, okay? So, the actual structure would be S1.5 bonded to this guy, well, it's designated as such, bonded to this guy, S1.5 bonded to this guy, S1.5 bonded to this guy, 1.5 bonded to that guy, okay? Meaning that no matter which oxygen you look at, all the oxygens are the same. They have, they participate in the same bond with the S, okay? You're never going to need to explain why it happens or you're not going to need to explain what it is. The most common way resonance is asked on the AP exam is they're going to give you, uh, in a multiple choice scenario, they're going to give you a bunch of chemical species and you have to say which one has resonance or in an FRQ they're going to explain to you if these are the Lewis structures for sulfate how come the bond energies of all the oxygen atoms are the same and you would answer because SO4 2 minus or the sulfate ion has resonance. Next topic is Vesper. Yes it's spelled like this it's an abbreviation. A Vesper is a method by classifying the shapes of atoms, okay? So, and the shape of atom, of an atom, or I should call it a molecule, because the shape of an atom by itself is its radius, which we already covered. However, the Vesper shapes are the shapes of atoms when they're in bonds, okay? So, for example, the C CO2 would have a linear Vesper shape. It's just an example. I'll get into everything right now. 
So the Vesper shape is based on something called the amount of electron domains. Okay, what is an electron domain? An electron domain is either one, a bonding site, or two, a lone pair. Uh, just something I'll clear up because before I get any further. Electrons do not exist on an atom as single electrons. They're either in a lone pair or they're on a different atom. Okay? Like in the uh, sulfate Lewis structure that I gave you before. There was no way to only have five electrons on the oxygen atom. It only had four or six. Okay? If it had four, it meant the fifth one went to a different oxygen atom and gave it six. Okay? Electrons never exist by themselves, only ever in a lone pair. Okay, these are the only two types of electron domains. Know that these are called electron domains. So in the CO2 molecule, the central atom, the carbon, has two electron domains. It has one bonding site here, and it has one bonding site here. Okay? In sulfate, S sulfate, it has four electron domains. One here, one here, one here, one here. Four electron domains. Doesn't matter if it's a single bond or a double bond or a triple bond, it still counts as one electron domain because it is bonded at one site. Okay. So, based off of the amount of electron domains you have, determines the shape of the molecule. So let me give you an example with lone pairs in it. H2O. O has six valence electrons, so it's got two lone pairs and two electrons participating in bonding. Okay, so it's got an electron domain here, an electron domain there, an electron domain here, and an electron domain there. Okay, two bonding sites and two lone pairs. It has four electron domains. So, let's get into what all of this is. I'm going to list them all out for you right here. Vesper is a pretty big memorization topic. I'd recommend you go in and out and find a Quizlet for this. It's, I, there's dozens of Quizlets, I'm sure, but it's, it's just something you have to memorize. So, in the case of one electron domain, like C triple bond N, and that would have a minus charge, in the case of one electron domain, you would be linear, okay? That's the name of the shape, you'd be linear. In the case of two electron domains, you would be linear again, which as we can see up here, it's linear. In the case of three electron domains, you would be trigonal, trigonal, planar. In the case of four electron domains, it would be tetrahedral. In the case of five electron domains, you would be trigonal, bipyramidal. In the case of six electron domains, you would be tetrahedral, no, excuse me, ectra octahedral. Yeah, octahedral. Okay. Now, these are only when all of the electron domains are bonding sites. Okay, so an octahedral since it corresponds to six electron domains, would mean six bonds. 
Now things become different once we introduce lone pairs into the equation. Again, one uh, lone pair would still be linear. Uh, one lone pair, one bond would still be linear. However, trigonal planar, trigonal planar, you have your center atom, you've got three bonds, would be trigonal planar, okay? But if you replace one bond with a lone pair, that becomes, it's called bet. That's the name of the shape, it's called bet, okay? If you have a tetrahedral, one, two, three, four, and you remove one bond and add a lone pair, that's called trigonal pyramidal. If you remove two bonds and replace them with lone pairs, that's bent again, but it's, I like to call it extra bent. It's not the literal name of it, but I call it extra bent because it's more bent than this one. Now this has two lone pairs, this has one. This one is more bent. So uh, let's move on to trigonal bipyramidal. If you removed, so trigonal bipyramidal would look like boom, bap, 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 bap. If you removed one and replaced it with a lone pair, that would be trigonal pyramidal. If you replaced one bond with a lone pair, that would be called seesaw. Yes, that's the real name. If you replaced two bonds with a lone pair, that'd be called a T-shape. If you replaced three bonds with lone pair, that would just be linear again. Octahedral. If you replace one bond with a lone pair, that is square pyramidal. Uh, replace two bonds with a lone pair, what would that be? That would be seesaw again, I think. Yeah, that would be seesaw again. And then three bonds with three lone pairs would be T-shape again. So just honestly make flashcards. And before you make flashcards, there's one more thing we need to include about all of these. It is the angles between all of their bonds, okay? So, what I recommend you do is after this video, just search up 3D images of all of the Vesper shapes and you'll be able to grasp, grasp this much easier. But first of all, in a linear atom, you know, the angle between the bond is 180. That's pretty self-explanatory, 180 degrees. The angle between the bonds in a trigonal planar atom are each 120 degrees. The bonds, the angle between the bonds of a tetrahedral atom are each 109.5 degrees. The trigonal bipyramidal and the octahedral are special because they have two different angle designations. If you look up the picture of the trigonal bipyramidal, it is a linear atom with a trigonal planar sort of in the middle, like this is the trigonal planar, this is one, two, three electron domains, and then through it I shove one bond and another bond. It looks like that. That's what the trigonal uh, bipyramidal looks like. Okay. So, the angles between all of the uh, trigonal planar section, those are all 120, so these bond angles are 120. And the angles between the top posts and the trigonal planar section is 90 degrees. And in the octahedral, it's in the same way. You've got a square planar as the plane, and then you've got one bond on top and bottom. 
so it looks like that. And so the bond angles between a square are 90 degrees and the bond angle from the top to the bottom is 90 degrees. So you need to memorize the shapes of all of the atoms with lone pairs, with bonds, with everything, and you need to memorize the angles between the electron domains, or what's commonly referred to as the bond angle. The only good thing is, let's look at octahedral for example, if I took one and replaced it with a lone pair, bond angle doesn't change. If I took a second one and replaced it with a lone pair, bond angle doesn't change. It's still an electron domain. Whew. What else? Hybridization. One thing, just a simple thing to memorize, we have this thing called hybridization in AP chemistry. I learned what it was because I was curious, but in no way, shape, or form do you even need to know what it is for the chem exam. You just need to memorize how it pertains to Vesper shapes. So all you need to memorize is sp3 hybridization designates a tetrahedral and therefore a 109.5 bond angle. sp2 designates a trigonal planar and therefore a 120 degree bond angle and sp or sp1 hybridization designates a linear shape and a 180 bond angle. Okay, just one last thing before uh, we call it wraps for today. So if you remember from the beginning of the video, I referenced we would be covering dipoles in much greater detail. Now's that time. Okay. So now that we know what Vesper shapes are, we can go into depth with uh, dipoles, okay? So like I said before, any bond that is not between the same two atoms or between CH is polar, okay? So in CO2, we would say that the CO bond is polar. Okay, so the dipole between the carbon and the oxygen yields a partial negative on the oxygen. Same goes for the one on the other oxygen, partial negative on the oxygen, partial positive on the carbon. Okay, so that means overall we have a partial negative pulling in this direction and a partial negative pulling in that direction. And since they are the same exact bond in both directions, they cancel out. Okay? That's why I needed us to cover Vesper before we covered this. Because CO2 is a linear molecule. Is a linear molecule, which means that if I have a dipole in one direction and the same exact dipole in the other direction, the two cancel out. And the entire molecule, therefore, is nonpolar. Even though it contains polar bonds, the polar bonds cancel each other out and make CO2 as a whole molecule nonpolar. Okay? That stands in stark contrast to H2O, water. Because water has two lone pairs up here, even though the OH bond is polar, even though the, oh, I shouldn't say even though, the OH bond is polar, O gains a partial negative charge, H gains a partial positive charge, but these are the same exact dipole. However, they are not linear. Their geometries do not cancel each other's out. I have a dipole in this direction, and I have a dipole in that direction, okay? So these aren't canceling each other out because they're not exactly opposite one another. Therefore, water is a polar molecule. It makes sense, you know, water is one of the most polar molecules we have. Okay, this side is negative, this side is positive, okay? Here, I could say this side is negative and this side is negative, 
Well, wait, if they're both negative, that means they're both the same. So it's inert. Okay? It doesn't do anything because the poles cancel each other out. Let's move on to something uh, more complex. Like, uh, let's say, CF4, carbon tetrafluoride. Okay? That would be a carbon. Let me, let me do my best to try and give you a 3D model, model of a tetrahedral. The tetrahedral, pretend each of my three fingers is a bond, is an uh, electron domain. Tetrahedral looks like that, okay? It's basically a... Uh, darn. It's basically a pyramid, three-legged pyramid with one domain on top, okay? And it's a tetrahedral. So you'd have a fluorine up, up here, you'd have a fluorine there, a fluorine there, and a fluorine here. So the, you, you could try to visualize that in 2D space as such. Okay. Now, the CF bond, you know, it's not a CC bond, it's not a CH bond, so it's polar. The fluorine is the more electronegative atom, so it pulls the electrons closer to it and it gains a partial negative charge. However, since all of the bonds are a carbon-fluorine bond, they all cancel each other out, okay? So if you look at the shape again, you've got one really strong negative pulling in this direction, and you've got a bunch of really strong negatives pulling out in either direction. And the nice thing about the tetrahedral atom is it looks the same no matter which way you look at it. So it would look the same this way, and if I turned my hand, it would still be three bases and a spire. Forgive me that I can't break my bones to make the, the thing look more realistic, but it would look the same no matter which way you turn it. So, and because of that, since all of the bonds are the same bond, this is again a nonpolar. If one uh, was maybe C, what, what, what could we bond it to? CH. That would mean that these bonds develop a partial negative charge and this section of the atom develops a partial positive charge. Okay, because there's nothing up here to cancel out what's going on down here. That's, that's honestly the trickiest thing for a lot of chemistry students, is to see polar bonds and to forget to account for the fact that the geometry is such that each of the polarities cancel each other out, okay? You could have NH3, NH3 minus, NH3, no, that would, yeah, NH3. NH3, you know, N has five valence electrons, so it has, it's who you would be N, lone pair, H, H, H. And this would be polar, right? Because the NH bond is a polar bond, and you've got nothing to cancel anything out, okay? That stands in stark contrast to a trigonal planar. Let's see, what's a good trigonal planar bond? BF3, boron trifluoride. Let's see, where is boron on the periodic table? Boron's right there. It's got three valence electrons. 
So boron would be a trigonal planar. F, F, F. Okay. So boron has three bonds. Each of the bonds are polar bonds, but boron trifluoride is a nonpolar molecule because all of its bonds are the same, and their dipoles cancel each other out. NH3 is a different story, because even though NH3, the NH bond is a polar bond, and all of the bonds are the same, the bonds don't cancel each other out because they're all on the bottom side of the molecule. You've got a lone pair on the top. So, uh, let's see here. Uh, hydrogen is less electronegative than nitrogen, so nitrogen would take on the po partial negative charge, and the hydrogens would take on the partial positive, okay? If you're ever confused on that, just remember hydrogen and carbon have the same electronegativity. Okay, so replace hydrogen with carbon on the periodic table, and you'll see that carbon is further to the left than nitrogen. So nitrogen is more electronegative, it's going to take on the negative charge. But you can see that if I replace this lone pair with a bond, this is supposed to be a tetrahedral atom, tetrahedral molecule. Okay. So because there is no fourth H bond here to cancel everything out, there's no bond there to cancel things, it's just a lone pair, then the dipole remains, okay? So it's a lot of visualization, it's a lot of work that you're probably going to have to do on scrap paper, but it's probably a really big part of a lot of the multiple choice questions, and you're gonna, if you're able to do this sort of thing quick, and effectively, like learn how to do it effectively before you learn how to do it quick, then this is probably the biggest thing that might help you on your AP Chem exam. So that being said, enjoy life guys.